Okay, good evening everyone. We're here to talk about Curse Engineering and Service Mesh and I was wondering if anybody know a little bit what it is or okay. One, that's very good, two, three. We're getting there, we're getting there. I hope that by the end of the presentation you will all know a little bit more about chaos engineering and where does it come from. So I'm a software engineer. I used to work at Unity, the game engine company, where I developed in Go actually um, since 2016-17. And we were having switching away from a big Node.js application to uh, Go actually and we had to handle system at scale that um, go up to 50,000 requests per second clockwise so we don't didn't have like a low period because once the US goes to sleep you have uh, all the Asia and and so on and so forth so a really good experience and right now I'm working on discovery like literally five minutes from here to um, make sure that people at Dplay to keep watching the show <laughs> So yeah, we're going to talk about a little bit uh, where does um, service mesh come from, what is it, a uh, little bit about Kubernetes, is anybody familiar with Kubernetes? Right, good, good, perfect. Um, what language is it written in? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I never programmed in Kubernetes. I was no. just wondering. <laughs> Yeah, of course, everything is, uh, all I'm using, all those programs, Istio is written in Go, and um, Kubernetes as well. We are gonna have two demo, one of Istio, because I think it's important to separate what is a service mesh and the chaos engineering part, which is, as we will see, a little bit different and new. So yeah, who here uses container? I can say like, great, perfect, Kubernetes, we did. Uh, who know what is a service mesh? or five-ish, well, great. Uh, who knows about what is an SLI, SLO, SLA? Ah, a little bit more. All right, good. Chaos Engineering, anyone? Yeah, seven people, okay. Who already did Chaos Engineering? Yeah, <laughs> trust me, it's, I, I'm pretty sure you already did it, you didn't know it was that. <laughs> so yeah, where does it come from? So basically, um, a project manager in a product manager at Google went touring across Europe and the US to find out what those uh, what his customer wanted and it basically fall into those four categories because they was trying to to, to solve the problem of uh, microservices so you you break down your app into small uh, easy manageable uh, units that does one thing one thing well and so they had this uh, customer that had more developer than Google it's a bank actually they, they they had the problem not really with the microservices and they didn't know what canary release was so you know it doesn't make sense to let's see how the bank today just handle money you don't want to do that but basically the, the their problem was the security and if you know about gdpr you know that uh, most of the traffic should be encrypted across services so that was a really big big problem because you have all those problems with the uh, security and rotating the certificate and all that so they, they they want and they see that okay you the service mesh is something that they say in the in the documentation like it's a la carte so if you go to a restaurant a la carte means you can choose what you want as opposed to maître d'hôte which is the chef tell you what is on the menu and that's it you you better like it because that's what that's what it is so you can have a lot by using a service mesh, and Istio is just one of those uh, service mesh. You also have like um, Linkerd, which is written in Scala, I think, and the, the Conduit, which is written in Go, and they, they're all trying. I, I highly recommend if you want to know more about that to watch the talk, it's really interesting. So it, it comes also with the fact that wh why is it a problem? What is the problem? Is that the, the eight fallacies of com distributed computing, and the first one is the network is not reliable. Like who here has to implement code 
to deal with timeout, retries. I, I can tell you it's everyone. Okay. <laughs> so we, we all have that surprise. And the thing is that if you want to, to laugh about it, this RFC is 22 years old and it's so relevant. It's three page. And they tell you about what you should look, know before starting to develop your application and calling the network. So yeah, to solve the problem, you use code. The problem with code is that you use a library. Anybody uses Vertex here? No, uh, what are the other one? The Netflix library to call and do retries. There's a hyper. Istrix, thank you. Anybody? Okay, two, yeah, and all those things. How do you do service discovery? Console? Yeah, you always have a little piece somewhere that does something. And so with all that, you have an explosion because you can only use it for one language. If you develop a, f a library in your company, you won't spend your time developing for all the language because you just want to use the language that your company is using. And barely company just switch to another language just for fun. It's a huge cost and they, they usually don't try. So you, you are actually tied up to one language or one ecosystem to, to build your microservices. And so this explosion, like who here literally can say that he's running the latest version of his framework? Congratulations, you're using Microsoft? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, it's pre-release, considering that I'm in an R&D department. But All right. Anyhow. All right. Congratulations. But no, we, we always have to to deal with that, and the code looks more like you you trying to please and to fix. Like seriously, if you ever implemented retries logic, can you did you get it right the first time? No. <laughs> no. no. So it, there is so many things, and the debugging is a pain. Like sometimes in, when you have too many microservices, you're just like, what happened? And you just don't know, you just pray that the user, like, it, it's insane. I can tell you war stories, but we, we're not gonna, I'm gonna move forward, so we have time for late questions. But the question is there, can, can Kubernetes help with this? No. Not really, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Kubernetes, <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad somebody participated, that's good. Kubernetes is really just there to orchestrate, so it, it handles your deployment. That's a that's a fixed that's a fixed issue. You 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 have Kubernetes, you set it up, you spend one year configuring everything, and then you find out that your favorite cloud open a service that you can just buy in. It's great, but the thing is that you you still have to figure out how to do service discovery, what you should call, and yeah, you you can call this Kubernetes API because. The, it's running at CD and all the nodes and everything are there. But what happened? How fast can the, the, the source of truth is? You know, what if a node goes down? How, how long do you notice it? So Kubernetes is not really there to help. And the reason is it's based on a very, very simple networking model, which has just three rules, which basically is no NAT, second, no NAT, and third one, no NAT. <laughs> So in case you don't know what a NAT is, is really interesting to see the Wikipedia is basically hiding behind the fact that it, it, it was there to uh, solve the problem of the limitation of the IPv4. So they, you, you wanted just one IP hiding many other IPs so that the, the um, attribution of IP was just evenly distributed and you don't have the but now we don't have that problem because we're all running in, in VPC and we have all our own uh, address range and everything. So the good thing about Kubernetes is that it's very simple. You will never get surprised about calling an IP and wondering like, what the hell is this? Is this an, behind something? No, it, you're calling an IP, that's the, the service you, you're supposed to talk to. So that's simple. Simplicity is really hard, but it pays off. And so here comes the, the service mesh and do you know, like the main problem, what does it solve? Do you have any idea? Okay, I'm gonna give it to you. It's communication between services. Because you're not gonna do all the communication yourself. You, 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 will, you, you cannot, in a world of communities where the IP change all the time, having some uh, structure that tell you, okay, I want this service to talk to that service. Unless you are 
IP table guru that can SSH into multiple nodes and, and configure that is really hard. So it's a network for services, not for bytes. And the architecture is, is quite actually simple. You can use this without Kubernetes, by the way. It works for any type of uh, bare metal, whatever, VM. And so what you have is your service is actually behind a proxy. This proxy, I don't know if you heard of it, it's not written in Go, unfortunately, but it's an uh, Envoy in de developed by Lyft. I don't know if you heard of it. Nobody? Okay. It's uh, Lyft handled 2 million requests per second, and they needed something that is really performant. So they wrote it in C++, which is with crazy async code, so that you actually know exactly the time it takes for the packet to be processed because it's really important if you put something in front of your network that you know how much this takes otherwise you will always find out about performance problem like where does it come from is it the proxy is it the proxy and so you will go crazy trying to debug and hunt those bottleneck all the time so this is super important and the thing is that to have a proxy it just you, you have you see every network request so you have telemetry for free. You know how much traffic is going through your service or going through or going out. And you can tell, you can route. So actually the network is much easier because you see here, this lower part is more like IP tables and those MPLS and Kubernetes is right here between three and four. So you just do the service mesh is going above, but the tags, the service name are actually on the above uh, HTTP, which makes it really easy to define. But another thing is that you have this little guy here, and this little guy's job, the Citadel, is to rotate the certificate so that you can actually encrypt all traffic seamlessly. You don't need to do anything more than setting, okay, I want security, which for bank and for GDPR is really helpful. You also have the um, pilot, which as his names uh, indicate, you just tell you, okay, this service, you can reach that service from there. Just go ahead. And the beauty of this uh, proxy is that it's actually, it doesn't need a file. It doesn't read from the disk. You can actually, by HTTP, con um, configure it. So you don't need to reload this, which was a pain if you ever had an ingress uh, router that you that you needed to to reboot or something like how do you do draining the request when you know you're switching the IP the, you have the failover or the routing change and you have to finish those requests without returning a 500 so that's all all that all that all that is controlled by the um, control plane and you have the data plane which is actually the, the mesh in itself all right but I was wondering what what's in the code how should I code my application to use a uh, service mesh and it's it's more simple than ever because you can give it a name you want basically you don't care this is okay they added a service domain to make it like if you have some namespace thing but just give it a name and and stick with it and that's it you you don't need to know I don't need for instance if I want to call you I just need to you know your name I don't need to memorize your phone number so that's kind of the idea here. So a little bit shocking to see like an hard coded I like address in the code. But it's actually super smart because that means I don't care. Just I want to talk to this guy. You make it work. So the, a different separation of concern arise. Now, on a more concrete note, this is like what Istio expects uh, when you write the manifest, and you have the HTTP. And you can actually define rules only in YAML. Yeah, sorry, if you wanted something else, I'm sure that uh, I actually thought about um, asking during an interview, here is a Kubernetes manifest in YAML, find where the mistake is. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you know if the guy knows or not, like this is, this is brilliant. But basically you can define super simple rules. Like I want for this particular user called JSON, I want to send all his requests to that particular service. Note that it's the same service here and here, just the versions change. So basically this is the tag in, in Kubernetes. You can tag your application and you know which versions they are. So you can actually do canary release, 
and everything super simply. So it, that just means for all requests row to V1, except if the header have an end user called JSON. Super simple. And of course that you can commit to your uh, Git repository or have version so that you actually know what's going on in production. You don't have to SSH into the, the, um, the host. And this is one of my favorite because after three time of re-implementing retries, you just get tired of it, so to, especially if you don't get it right. So this is how you do retry. Anybody had a cascading timeout failure sometimes? Like, it's super hard, yeah. The, those, those timeouts are super hard to detect. You never know if your library handle it correctly or not. So, I mean, this is like, okay, let me handle the, tri the timeout. I want to know when this time, I want to set exactly how much time it thinks should take. So about security, we already encrypt everything. You can also tell policy that I don't want this service to talk to that service. Like this should never happen. If this service talk to that service, somebody hacked into the box because n there is no data in between that could be shared. So you, you can enforce policy and have a clear audit of what's going on in the network and observability. You know everything of everything that's going through your network. Of course, it has to go through the po proxy. If you want to make call outside of the proxy, you can, but that's, that's up to you. So, uh, a question. Yes. Does the traffic in, in does all traffic go through the proxy? In like the everything is internal in, in, in this. Uh, in this pod. Yeah. Yeah. If you are in, if the proxy is in the pod, it can. But you can define rules that set, go to outside the cluster. For instance, you you might not need the proxy for that, or you do. It depends uh, if if you want. But all that you can be you can configure. So it's it's really up to you and up to your the policy because sometimes it's not only about okay here is a service mesh enjoy it's more like okay how do we get from what we have to having um, a common way of explaining what is happening in the network I guess should I mean would all if we want all this uh, observability would, would uh, sort of all incoming traffic go through the proxy and all communication between services also go um, yeah, you say it's configurable, but would, would be the sort of normal case. Yeah, the, that's what you want generally. Like the the main use case is okay. That's the mesh. That's the mesh. I I want all my service to be there, and I want to be able to tell how many service is there. And actually, you don't have one version of what service. So you, you don't have one um, instance. You usually have many. So how do you load balance everything? Because sometimes you don't want to do round robin like the basic way. You want to do the least request. So send to the one who's not busy. And that's that's different policy you can implement very easily. It's actually just a one-liner, which is why this is so appealing. So what I can show you is, yeah, we're gonna do a little demo. And so you have this um, application here, which is actually the same as here. So you have a ingress, the traffic enters here, you have one proxy, which is Envoy. You have an app developed in Python, running in a pod. Again, you have the proxy. The proxy will send to three different versions of a Java app. And you will understand why. You have also <coughs> Ruby app. And those two here are calling the Node.js. And the thing is that because you know everything what's going on, you know who's talking to who with a percentage of requests, with the latency, with everything. And we can even do something a little bit more fun, like, so this is the, the latency, you can, it's a little tool called Slapper, you can find it in, in GitHub, but basically you see how the um, latency to your service is going. That generates a little bit of traffic, and that's good, because we see now the animation of what's going on and where where is it going, and all that you have, like, this, I, I literally installed it in, in 10 minutes. So you might need more time to configure it or fine tune it to your taste, but that's, that's the main idea. So. That's real time for any network of any size. Yeah, actually the, it is. It's, uh, 
How can I say? The I I don't. It, it was really built for those massive uh, customer that had like because. You have those enterprise, and usually what they do with the network is they have hardware, which cost, cost a bunch. And they don't want that hardware anymore because it's like super expensive. Even their, their budget is like billions, they don't care. They, they, they can show off a little bit. And by having that, it increase, it, first of all, it reduce a lot the time to get something to production. Because I don't know if you ever had to create a ticket to open a port in a firewall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously. <laughs> Just your grandchildren maybe run the server, you know, it's like, it's insane. So, so this is more about the, there's this new trendy word called GitOps, that you, you put everything in Git, and now your network is in Git as well. So you can actually iterate, and the thing is that two, this little proxy that you see in the pod can handle two million requests per second. Before you reach that, you, you tell me. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. <laughs> we have a very manageable data set. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's really good. But the thing is that you get everything. Oh, I don't know what this is. But yeah, the, the nice thing is that you you have your services here. Why are you annoying me? We forgot to feed it. Yeah, it seems like it. Oh, it's. I love the connection. Yeah, my laptop went to sleep, so that's why. Some of them did survive, though. Good. So yeah, that's much better. So you see here, you can actually understand what your service is. You don't even have the only your services. You also have your machine and cluster. So I didn't have to configure that dashboard. This came like out of the box because you have all those Istio dashboard. If I want to see the workload, you see that, okay, incoming success, success rate of request. So basically I can have and, and say, okay, this year we didn't had, uh, we had le less than 0.1% error in production. So, which is really good for your contract. If you have uh, some kind of um, service level agreement with a customer, you can say, well, we, we provided you with the service and we agree. You don't want to have 100% because that means that you don't innovate anything. You know, they, they say only two things can be 100% um, and that's a pacemaker or DNS. You laugh because of the DNS or the pacemaker? The DNS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, because as soon as you want to try something, it's ping Google or, you know, th that has to be up. So that's, I have 10 minutes left. Let's see. So we have this little app here, and it's quite simple because, as you can see, the star changed. So here you don't have anything. That's version one of the app. That's black, that's version two. That's tr red, that's version three. So you can see that it's actually, uh, as I'm the only one on there, you have actually a round robin um, load balancing. And so what we're gonna do here is to set everything to V1. <coughs> All right, so did it work? Yes. Now, for those in the back who cannot see, I'm gonna, you might be now you see that every time I reload, there is no star or little thing. The good thing is I want my user JSON here I want to test something with him. I want to say, okay, let's see JSON. I want to, I want him to see V2. So I have a manifest. And basically the manifest, I show it to you, is with the rules. I can sure find it back. This, this is the manifest. Like those a few lines of YAML, that's, that's all there is to know. So, this is still going strong. JSON is there. Did I apply? Yes. So now I'm with JSON and everything is with V1, uh, V2, sorry. The app itself, where is it? There. It's still going. It's still on the previous version. 
so no problem about that although I can still see because I have a tracing for free I can debug bottlenecks in case of performance problem so you can see actually which version if there is a regression or not you can actually see look for instance you see that the call of this service happens before this one maybe you can call in parallel to save a little bit of bandwidth and and time so um, that was the demo now you know that you can actually block a user or any rules actually to um, to do, you can manipulate the services the way you want now you're in control you can actually do canary release you can shift the percentage of the traffic you can uh, you can even introduce delay as we will see later which is why we're going to talk now about chaos engineering any question about service mesh how do you do like almost batching for example you have four backend servers up and you need to make requests to multiple more than that can you handle that with this, with this kind of service mesh like like you have you have to run four jobs in parallel or more than the number of services that you have running does it handle that or well if you deploy four jobs yeah okay so yeah, you, okay. you just, there's no queuing with, with tags. You in Kubernetes, you can tag some some um, deployment, and with that, it can it, it it is able to find them back. So you define the rule. You 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 define the data. You tag the service the way you want, and you and you give the rules to follow the those tags, and with that, you can do a, a lot of things. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna continue. So about chaos engineering. We have this very clear definition, which is which was started basically at uh, Netflix. So we have chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent condition in production. <sighs> that was it. So yeah, sometimes you want to have some, like even if you can prove that your microservices is totally perfect, you have because you have a, a really complex system you cannot guarantee that working together they will offer you like they will always work so the the way to do that is to actually to to test and the way you test is the idea of a vaccine you know you inject a little bit of of virus don't not real virus like the the one that you know make your immune system a little bit weak so you develop antibody and so it's actually not really chaotic. It's very like thoughtful and, and scientific and you don't want to break down production basically. That's that's the main point. You you really want to have some careful thought about what you want to test and what do you want to achieve. Because and the problem with chaos engineering is not really the the practice in itself, it's chaos monkey. It came by saying, okay, let's blow up some, some host somewhere and see how the system react. If, if you didn't prepare, it will react the, the way you expect it to, and that's really not the way you want. So chaos engineering isn't done to cause problems, it's done to reveal them. You reveal the problem to your engineers so that they go and fix the stuff, because otherwise they're going to ship to production and then, oh, it's somebody else's problem. And that's why they, they build it, they run it. And so chaos engineering is exploratory <laughs> testing. That's what you need to remember. It's like experiment. You, you don't know really. And one way that I'm sure, it, did anybody try to restore backups? <laughs> right. Did it work the first time? You know, probably not. So chaos engineering is like, is like saying, okay, I want to make sure that in case something wrong happened, we can recover from this. Can we recover from the outage in production? That, that's the question chaos engineering. And so, yeah, those with uh, children will understand. <coughs> um, and usually in your code, you don't test those little thing like who tests the health check, you know? I'm not even sure that endpoint is secure in any way, so those kind of things the, the the deployment sometimes it goes wrong who knows 
and draining the request when it, with a graceful shutdown instead of just kill nine this poor bastard, you know? And but kill nine is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, if you ever do kill nine, you can write uh, to slash dev slash termination in Kubernetes and it will actually save whatever you write there in the logs so that you, you will see actually what up, how, what crushed it. Really useful when you have to debug, I can tell you that. So the type of errors that you want to, to check is also like, how do I not DDoS myself? That is a really interesting question if you do retries. I, did anybody DDoS himself once? Okay, well. You haven't lived if you haven't tried. <laughs> <laughs> so true, yeah. But anyway, this, those type of error are, are really hard to catch in the code or in the test. And it's basically the same, the only way to test is in production. And I want to show you with a service mesh, you can do that really safely by allowing JSON to just, you know, you can split on the user and just testing for one user instead of crushing all your, everybody. So a word of caution is that chaos sounds really fun for you and your colleague. Your manager will not understand. You, if you come to him and say, okay, I want to, or to her, and I want to uh, blow up half the cluster, he will look at you and wait until you say, I was kidding, or something like that. So the, the, the word resiliency has a much more, like if you have to sell it, resiliency will get you further. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But the thing is that resiliency is actually a science that was there way before Netflix coined the term. And chaos engineering is actually a subset of resilience engineering. Of course, resilience engineering always, also works for building and, you know, it's, it's really a field of, of engineering that is studied and people have <coughs> papers on it. While chaos engineering is basically two, three years ago, Netflix came up with this because they wanted to fix problem and make sure that they, um, they, they, they came up with Chaos Monkey and Chaos Kong to tear down an entire um, AWS region because AWS didn't want to give them an API to tear down a region, don't know why, but that's, that's another question. So I would highly recommend if you have to sell it to, to talk more about residency and the result you're gonna get with it. So that's my way, if you have to start, just set up monitoring before. Uh, if you don't have anything, if you don't measure, it doesn't exist. As simple as that. Then you have to identify something that uh, as the normal state, like this is how it works. And then make a hypothesis based on that steady state and test it. Like, can we actually recover? Can we, let's do a failover of the database from the, sla the, the replica to, to, to another, another, like switch master, master and replica and write the report, it is so important. Just have a trace somewhere that, you know, what you did, why you did, how long you did, how well it go, and if it fails, just have a plan to get back up. So yeah, you also have the this role that site reliability engineering was actually a, a term invented by Google because they had to maintain all those services. And so the, the, the main job was to identify weakness because they wanted the, the service to run like all the time. And they came with the SLI, which is service level indicator. So you have, a, for instance, a metric that is one metric that is in the graph that does, is not here anymore because I haven't tried to get some, something. But basically your metric can be the success rate of request or the, the, the number of milliseconds you answer because usually you work with microservices, you have uh, some, you have to reply under 100 milliseconds or something. Can you really tell that you, you, that's what you're doing? So those things are really important to know. And service level objective is, it's a compromise on, it's not really a compromise, but basically you say, okay, this is our objective. We don't want 100%, but 99% is good enough for us. Our user will survive, we can provide that. And the agreement is really with your customer, like we guarantee that and there's money at stake. So with all those information, you can make really informed decision and fine tune your business. Th this is money to, to managers. So it, it really helps selling this um, new technology 
when you, you claim that you can actually improve the business. And so the last demo, almost finished on time, uh, we still have this JSON user. The thing is, now we're going to try to break his, um, his connection. It's still going on the version 2, but now I will introduce a delay. Because I want to test how does the application react. And as you can see, I cannot refresh, but if you go to the other application, my application was just fine for all my users. So that's really neat when it comes to there. And you see, this is the result I'm expecting. So the page does not crash, just a part of the page crash, which is much better than to say, wow, everything in that is down and I don't know why. So you, you can actually improve, even the, for web developer, front-end developer, this is a really good tool. And that's it, here are the resource. I hope you enjoy. If you have any question, please let me know. I will post the slide online and uh, you can contact me here if you feel like it or if you have any question. Any question? Well, I have one question. Listen, I'm assuming that the versioning works because you have multiple deployments of your services with multiple versions, right? So you, you leave the old versions running until you don't need them. Yeah, you can configure that, yeah. or you can do canary release, or you might not have just one team working on that. You might have a few teams, and they have different version. I don't know. It it really depends. But I can show you uh, very quickly what's what's in there. So yeah, you can see here that I have three versions. This is a little bit small. So I have three versions of the same review. And you see that there is actually two container in that pod. One of them is the proxy. So you actually see it. And the memory footprint of that thing is like 10 megs. So it's not like it's going to blow up. It's not a Java app like uh, that. No, but because the JVM is, is Yeah, I know. And um, well, yeah, that to answer your question. Yeah, uh, a pod is that a Kubernetes? Kubernetes for? Yeah, it's uh, it's like a bundle. If you want to bundle container together, they share the same network. Okay. That's why there is one proxy per pod. Yeah. Is because the the proxy just hooked that okay. one, and all the traffic goes through that. You can also guarantee that every every container within the the pod uh, is ex actually able so to co communicate over file system as well. They will be co-located on the same node, okay. so you can guarantee that. But between two pods, you have to go over yeah. a network because they can end up on two different nodes, mm -hmm. basically. Got it. Yeah. So, it, it's re I mean, chaos engineering is something I find really cool. It's uh, I feel like it's a very good way of building confidence in your software because you're constantly crashing it in controlled mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you don't really know how how uh, secure or uh, resilient your system is until you've actually tried to crash it. Exactly. Uh, before that, it's just hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like it. I know that Kubernetes on their web page they have like a poor person's uh, canary releases, and mm -hmm. that is basically pulling up like three pods of this uh, this service and then one pod of this service, and then um, it will actually uh, through the 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 service resource you can you can actually make it. Uh, go to different um, uh, services as well, but it's not nearly as powerful as, the, as this. Mm. Uh, it's n you're not able to like route based on a, uh, a header or uh, like a user. Yeah, or anything exactly. Like that. So, so it's definitely uh, something. I'm really looking forward to trying this out myself. It's in version one since yeah. like a few days ago. So, <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, they they yeah. did a lot of work. To the the it's actually a, a joint venture between Google and IBM. And the amount of work going into that is super, super impressive. Like if you want to see a little bit of Go code, I recommend going and check it out. Because what they do is they, they try to use the, not the latest, latest, but the latest best practice. They have really good engineer working on that. And so it's always inspiring the, to work. Of course, the, the, the website and the documentation are a little bit widespread, 
but they implement so fast so many things it's it's like we if you have to to go from zero to kubernetes and you have to go to from from nothing to to istio is almost the same amount of work so it's not something that i would recommend to switch all over one day but it's a la carte so you can choose and pick and say okay we're just gonna start with a simple service discovery and th that usually is the selling point for most um thing because you don't want to use an, an another external tool but it's it's hard work and you can you need to learn how to uh, debug it that's that's all like everything when it works fine when it works fine and then yeah. reality but uh again thank you very much um if uh, anyone's more interested in istio i'm assuming that we're gonna see a breakout session Okay. Uh, on on Istio, I don't know. I don't want to be known known as the Istio guy, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> or chaos engineering for that matter. Yeah. Uh, but so I advise you if you want to hear more about that, um, I'll put up a, a note. So um, the time is, yeah, great. So uh, what we're going to do now is something called open space.